But what we're doing today is we're starting this, this new series of, of messages at our church called Feed the Need. And what I'm going to talk about today is this situation. And what happened to me is, this happens sometimes. Um, I was getting into the message. I was preparing for it. I was doing a lot of studying. And uh, I, I, I just kept, there's just so much here, Lord. There's just so much here. And so I, I wrote it all out. And um, the old pastor's joke, you know, some people, I don't know, pastors have old jokes, I know. Pastors are just as nerdy as everybody else, but one of the old pastor jokes is, that message, you could have cut that message in half and then thrown both halves away. Um, so this one is, I cut it in half because it was just so much content. So today I'm, I'm talking about real thirst. And so there's a part one to this, and real thirst. What Jesus did, and he did this a lot, and I, I have to assume that lots of times he did it to people's consternation. He did it to people who were annoyed by it. What Jesus would do oftentimes is he'd be confronted with a need. Somebody would bring a need to him. I need to be healed. Um, I need to, to eat. I need something. And they'd bring a need to him. And then Jesus would address the real need. And so it, was, it had to be one of these things where if you came to Jesus looking for something and he gave you something completely different than what you were looking for, but after that encounter with Jesus, that's when people realize that's exactly what I needed. It's often the, the case today. And today what we're going to look at is John chapter 4, this story. And there's a lot of, of verses there, you know, verses 1 through 26, 26 verses. And I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to look at the highlights of what Jesus said. So what's going on? Let me, let me, give you, let me set, set up the story why I called it Real Thirst. In John chapter 4, you have Jesus. And what's going on is Jesus is he's taking him and his disciples. They're, they're going to from, from Judea, which is this... this uh, uh, area in the south to an area in the north called Galilee. So they're traveling north. But in order to do that, what they do is they walk through a specific region called Samaria. Now, that's a big deal right there. And we don't get that. We don't see that as a big deal just because it's, we're 2,000 years later and we don't understand all of the cultural nuance that was going on there. And maybe you do, and if you do, that's great. Um, but what, what was going on is Jewish people, people from the, the southern region of, Jude of Judea, they uh, consider themselves to be the real Jews, the authentic Jewish people. And then the people in the north in a region called Samaria, they consider themselves to be Jews as well, but they had followed different teachings, making them the right people and making the people in the South the wrong people. And so there was a lot of enmity, a lot of animosity between these two groups. A lot. There are hundreds of years worth of history of these two groups butting heads with each other. And what a lot of Jewish people would do when they were on their way to Samaria or, sorry, on their way to Galilee, they would go around Samaria. They wouldn't even, even though the most direct route was to walk through it, they wouldn't do it. In fact, they considered their feet defiled if they walked on Samaritan dirt. They, so they, one of the things that they would, if, if a Jewish person ever walked through Samaria, when they were leaving Samaria, they would dust their feet off because they didn't want Samaritan dirt on their feet. In John chapter 4, verse 4, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to. Now, he, I don't think he had to out of necessity, as in it's the shortest way, so I have to go that way. I think he had to because he knew what was going to happen here in John chapter 4. So he has to go through Samaria. So he's on his way through Samaria. They stop in this town, and there's this real famous well in this town called Jacob's Well. And the, the, the tradition holds that the father of the Jewish people, this guy named Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. So that's, that's, that's why he's known as the father of the Jewish people. This guy, Jacob, the tradition holds that he dug the well, and he dug it for his ancestors. And now it's in the region of Samaria. And so they, they it's a very, it's kind of a, a, a famous place or a popular place to them. Well, Jesus and his disciples, they stop right at this well. And his disciples, they go into the town and they go into the town to buy food and to buy lunch for the whole group. Jesus stays behind at the well. So it's about noon and this woman comes out to, to draw some water from the well, which makes sense. It's in the Middle East. It's probably hot. They're in the desert and so there's this place for water. So she comes out at noon and Jesus says something to her that's very profound. And when we read it in the text, it doesn't seem profound, but it is. In John chapter 4, verse 7, Jesus said this. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? 
Now, we, we, we read that and don't think anything of it. That was a big deal. That was big. Because what Jesus just did is he is a Jewish person, and he's developed his reputation not only as a Jewish person, but as a Jewish rabbi, a teacher of the Jewish people. And he's in Samaria, and there's this woman. So for a man to talk to a woman, okay, all right, that's a little sketchy in Jesus' culture, but he did it. And then for a Jewish man to talk to a Samaritan woman, whoa, Jesus, you're breaking down my cultural norms here, sir. That's what he did. But not only did he talk to her, he said, will you give me a drink? Oh, Christian, that doesn't sound like, he needed water too. Why is that such a big deal? I I have a a bottle of water here, because I I get parched sometimes when I'm preaching. Uh, There are very few people in this room. If you come up to me after church today, after the service, and you see me with my water, and you say, hey, can I have a drink? I'll get you a bottle of water. I'll go get you some water, but this is mine. I don't know you. I'm not going to let you drink after me. And if I do give you the water, guess what? You can keep it. Jesus doesn't have a bucket. He doesn't have something to get water out of the well with. When he said, will you give me a drink, he was talking about the bucket that the woman brought to get water. That's why she's there. Jesus is asking to share the cup with her. When he says, will you give me a drink, not only is he he recognizing the fact that he's a man, she's a woman, he's a Jew, she's a Samaritan, but he's he's going so far as to walk up to her and say, hey, can I share a cup with you? Because I'm thirsty too. The point that I get from this is that Jesus gives value. Jesus gives value. And we need to hear that this morning. We need to hear that in our culture today. Our culture today is going through this real big push on identity. You need to find value in in your identity. Find value in your identity. And one of the things that we find value in all kinds of things, find value in in, in gender, find value in in race. Well, Christian, that, that sounds, I don't know where you're about to go with this. I'm just staying with the scripture right now. Because what was going on here is in Jesus's culture, Jesus could find value in being a man, but she couldn't find value in being a woman in Jesus' culture. In Jesus' culture, he could find value in being a Jew, but she couldn't find value in being a Samaritan. We do the same thing today. We find our own cultural norms to raise up our value if we try to find value in our own identities. And what happens is, is if we look to Jesus, all of those other things that we use to identify us, there is something even greater in Jesus. In Jesus, we can find a real value. A value that's not based on the cultural norms, a value that we don't ascribe to ourselves, but a value that Jesus gives to us. It's something better. It's something beyond, and that's what we find with Jesus. Now, I don't know, like, there's, there's too many people in here for me to know on a first-name basis. I'll, I'll try. I'll work on it. Uh, I met a gentleman this morning named John. John, I'm, I remember your name. I don't know where you are right now because there's a lot of people. John, I remember you because I'm, now, now that's locked in my brain, hopefully. I don't know every single person in here, but I do know a lot of people struggle with self-worth, with self-doubt, with with thinking they're not good enough, or thinking the world is against them, or thinking that the world might hate them. I have to believe this Samaritan woman struggled with those things. Why? You ever wonder? So she's at the well at noon. It's not a very common time to go to the well. Why does she go to the well then? We're going to see that later as we get into this story. But she's there so she could be by herself. And here's Jesus, a Jewish man who puts himself on the same plane as her and asks her for a drink. This is a big moment. Jesus just gave her value. You don't have to find value in the things of this world because oftentimes the things that we try to find value in in this world, will leave us feeling empty. Or we'll find value in the things of this world, and what we do is we devalue everybody else that doesn't have those things. There is something better in Jesus. In Jesus, there is real value. He gives us value. He becomes the source of our value. He becomes the source of our identity. Jesus gives value. 
All right, so Jesus says this to this woman. He goes, hey, will you give me a drink? And she's, she, like, you would expect, she balks at this. She goes, what? You're asking me for a drink? You're a Jewish man, and I'm a Samaritan woman, and you're asking me for a drink? Seriously? Look at what Jesus says to her. It's pretty awesome. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, living water doesn't mean that the water itself is actually alive. What living water means is water that brings life, that gives life. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, now Jesus is elevating the conversation. Before, he was meeting her where she is. In, in all earthly terms, he says, hey, will you give me a drink? He's still talking about that water right there at the well. But now he's lifting it up. He's getting spiritual on her. And he says, "You, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you for a drink, then you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. The value, the, the point that I see from this is that Jesus gives life. Now that's important. The reason that's important is oftentimes when you hear the word life, you, you, and man, this makes me sad. It does. It does make me sad. We hear the word life and we think what that means is not dead. You're either alive or you're dead. We just think life is something that's living. Jesus is talking about so much more than living. That's why in, in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus says, "I have come so that people may have life and have life abundant." Jesus is talking about a life where he, he already talked about it with this woman. He already showed it, displayed it to this woman when he, when he ascribed value to her just by talking to her, but also asking to share a cup with her. He's giving her value. But Jesus is talking about real life, a full life, a life of satisfaction. Now, that sounds hard in and of itself. What do you mean a life of satisfaction? Is anybody going through life entirely satisfied about everything? Not very many hands. Right? We all, it, look, it, this, is, this is one of the things that I, I, I struggle. I made, the, I made the stupid mistake this week. This is, a, this is a terrible mistake on my part. Um, I'm off of social media. Uh, I do have a Twitter account. I check it like, Never. Um, and then I, I, I used to have a Facebook page. I don't have a Facebook page any, anymore, so I'm totally off of social media. It's just kind of a time waster for me because I needed to better manage my time. And so I'm not saying, if you are on social media, I'm not saying you're a time waster. Don't hear that. Um, good for you. You're better than me. So I'm off of Facebook, and I heard a couple of, peop a couple of people on staff this week talking about all the Facebook campaign that we had for, for the grand opening. And they said, well, people are commenting on it. And I was like, oh, I want to see. <sighs> Bad move, Christian. Bad move. I went and I read the Facebook comments, and there's some negative ones. You know, I thought that church was a used car sales, used car lot, that you were going to sell us cars. And, you know, no. One person said, and I don't even know where this came from, oh, I thought that was a Korean church. <laughs> you, you are welcome to come here if you're a Korean. We're kind of an everybody church. I don't understand, like, what makes a Korean church look Korean. But okay, you know, whatever. And it, I also read some of the negative things, you know, like, you know, how could they spend all that money when there's people in need? And I thought, man, these people are mean. Why is everybody so mean? That was a, that was a bad move on my part. When I talk about life, let's, let's just be honest. There is a lot when we go through life we're really good at complaining about that we are not satisfied with. We go through life thirsty. We go through life thirsty. We go through life wanting something in us to be satisfied, something in us to be filled. And oftentimes we're walking through life and it just, it, we just know something's missing. When I say Jesus gives life, what I'm talking about is Jesus fills that which is missing. That's why he says to this woman, if you knew the gift of God, it says in, Roman, it says in the book of Romans, we know from Romans, <laughs> the, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The gift of God that Jesus is talking about is life. And it's not just life that we can, we can go through and, and suffer through. Look, 
if this is what life is right now, and Jesus said you can live forever, I'd probably say no thank you. There is a lot to this life that's just not pleasant, that's unsatisfying. And what happens with Jesus is when we come to faith in Jesus, when we accept Jesus, he gives life, but it's not life as in not dead. It's life as in to truly be alive, to have that eternal thirst that you have, to be eternally satisfied, which is why right after this, this woman goes, wait, Jesus, the Jewish guy that's talking to me, she doesn't know it's Jesus yet. She goes, okay, so you... Are you, are you like greater than our father Jacob? Because he's the one that dug this well. And I don't, you don't have a bucket. If the well's like 75 feet deep. How are you going to get water and give me living water? And Jesus expands on this. He, again, he elevates the conversation again. Look what Jesus says after this. Jesus answered her, everyone who drinks this water, the water that you came to the well for, everyone who drinks that is going to be thirsty again. But he's not talking about this water. He's talking about living water. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He's reiterating the fact that it's life. I'm here to give you life, lady. Jesus gives us life. And then he gets redundant. And I love that. I love it when Jesus gets redundant because sometimes I need things repeated. He says, they would become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's the redundancy. Life in Jesus is eternal. He doesn't have to say it's eternal, but he reminds us that it's eternal. What he's saying when he says eternal life this is why the value I get from this is that Jesus gives eternal life. He's saying, I'm going to give you a life that satisfies. I'm going to give you a life where there's, you don't have to complain about anything anymore because I'm going to satisfy everything. But this is a life that is never ending. It is a life that will continue. It is a life that will go on. It is an eternal life. Now, now, if you were to ask me, Christian, okay, so do you want to live forever? If you tell me that I can live forever with the life that Jesus gives me, then yes, absolutely I want to live forever. Because in Jesus, I find real life. I find lasting, real value. Not in anything that I've done, but what he freely gives. All of this is about the gift of Jesus. That's why Jesus opens up with this. Right after he says, give me a drink, he says, if you knew the gift of God... Jesus gives us this great gift of life, life abundant, and that sort of life that does not end. It is eternal. It's forever. It's eternal life. And that's the power of Christ. That's what Jesus does for us. Now, if you come back next week, man, Jesus gets real, real quick with this lady, and we're going to talk about that next week. That's why this week was called part one. Part two is, is next week. Jesus gets real with her because Jesus knows her, and he wants to give her life. He's proclaiming life to her. And sometimes we get lost, I think, in the idea of, of what life is and everything. And so let me, let me be very clear. Let me explain the life of Jesus Christ for us. It's very, very simple. And it's very, very profound. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Honestly, I think that's what makes life so hard sometimes. Is we're just a bunch of imperfect people living life together. And because I'm not perfect, and because you're not perfect, why in the world could we possibly imagine that we deserve an eternity in heaven with God? We don't deserve that. We can't ever earn that. We can't ever deserve that because we're not perfect. I'm not as perfect as God. That's what the Bible says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But God is a God of love. In fact, the Bible says he is love. And since God is love, he sees me in my imperfect state. He sees you in your imperfect state. And he says, I want that person, Christian, Everybody else, I want that person to have life. And the only way that they can have life is if I take every imperfection, every wrong thing that they have done, that they're doing now, and that they're going to do, if I take that upon myself, I will take it away from them. And I will give them the righteousness of my own glory. That's what it says in, the, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him 
that be Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin so that we might attain the righteousness of God. When we accept and when we believe in Jesus Christ, what Jesus does with us is he gives us life and life eternal. And he does that through his own life, his own death, and his own resurrection. That is the gift of God that Jesus is talking about when he says, if you only knew the gift of God. It's extended to you today. It's been extended to me. I remember praying as a little boy to accept Jesus. I remember going through life and never really becoming on fire for Jesus until I was a teenager and then something snapped and something broke in my heart and I knew that Jesus had made me alive. And so the only way I can explain this, Jesus gives eternal life to you, is that before I knew Jesus, I was dead and I didn't even know it. And now that I've come to faith in Jesus Christ, he's given me this life, this amazing wellspring of life within me that is not anything I did, it's not anything I deserve, it is the free gift of God. That's why Jesus gives it. And it's a gift that's extended to all of you, just as it was to me. It's exciting to me to think. <laughs> I hope it's exciting to you. I ho it's exciting to me to think that this life, this great life that Jesus has given me, is eternal. That someday heaven is waiting that I'm going to go to heaven, that I'm going to see my, my loved ones, that, that I'm going to be with Jesus forever. And not only that, but Jesus has given me mission to do in this life. Now he's given me purpose to do. Jesus has given me value in this life now. I'm very excited that he also gives me that life eternally.